I have a long, long history of working in the arts. I've been doing it for about 24 years, and I've been fortunate enough to have been able to find my calling and stick my feet deep in the sand and, and, and stay where my heart belongs, which is working with artists and working in exhibitions and working with educators, musicians, writers, and so on. I feel, I feel fortunate every day when I wake up that I'm able to go out and have this life. And I think that uh, when I'm meeting with people and I'm talking to them and I find that they're complaining about their careers and their family circumstances or things that are bogging them down, broken cars, that I, I think about how fortunate we are to even have this day, to be able to be here actively living this moment. I, I sometimes go to bed at night and I look over at my son sleeping and I think the fact that he's there is a miracle. How, where did he come from? What, did, what, is, what is he doing here in this house? I think the same thing about myself when I meet my parents and we go on vacations, we visit, I say, how did I get here? What did you guys do? I mean, it, it, it seems so improbable. I mean, the fact that I've given this chance to be here today, to be here at TED, is so exceptional in, in, in my life. I just want to say that I will never forget this moment. Um, being a curator and being somebody that works with artists, I'm always constantly thinking outside the box. It's my job to think outside the box. Uh, artists call me, they have concepts, they have projects, they have dreams and hopes, and they're calling a curator and they're calling a director of an institution and they're saying, hey, you know, make it a reality. You know, make my show big, get me press, get writers there. I want to be on TV. I want to have my work seen by everyone, and you're the girl to do it. And you think to yourself, okay, so I'm the ultimate scavenger hunter. I'm the ultimate person to turn your dreams into reality. Where do we begin? And I, and I lay low for a little while. Like some of the artists were saying, I lay low and I think, okay, is this too big for me? I, I, am I going to be completely overwhelmed by the fact that I have this person's life in my hands? And yeah, it's a huge, huge thing to deal with. But I think to myself, look at that person and look at the credibility of that artwork and look at that intensity and passion and look at what it could mean to the public and to students and to people who may have never in their life be able to see this if I hadn't been able to present it to them. And I think to myself, I could set this thing off. I could set this thing off so hugely that no one would forget it, the artist's life would be changed forever, and now here I am, selfishly, a part of their history, a part of their life. When I look on those blogs and I look on all their resumes and bios and I see exhibition, you know, Grand Central Arts Center, exhibition, the Frank M. Doyle Arts Pavilion, and I think to myself, below all of those names and titles, I was somewhere in the fabric of making that magic happen for that artist, making that thing a reality. Every step that I walk, I'm thinking about the next move. It's like an unbelievable experience because Everything I do, there's a huge response and reaction to. If I make the call to a donor and I say, hey, I've got this amazing thing, you know, if you sponsored this show and you got on board and we could produce this publication for this artist, I mean, this is a guy who's been working 50 years in the industry of art, who's never been recognized, we can make something happen here. And they say, Andrea, how much do you want? All you have to do is ask. And that magic starts to, it starts to build, it starts to grow. And I think to myself, how fortunate am I to be able to live outside the box? But actively making that happen is hard sometimes because you have your normal life and you have normal things happening that, that sometimes bog you down, make you feel like you, you're just a little sluggish and you can't quite do it every day. You can't turn it on. I was told really when I was very, very young, a friend of mine once said, she says, you've got the eye of the tiger. And I said, are you talking about like Rocky, like Marciano, like the eye of the tiger? And she says, no, you're just like, you're fiery and you just, you're, you're out there and you're hunting and you're going for it. And this was like kid stuff. Like, I mean, I had a paper out. I, I was doing different odd jobs, mowing people's lawns. And I mean, I was considered a tiger when I was this little kid mowing a lawn. And I thought for something, there's just something in me that makes me hungry, hungry for change, hungry for growth and hungry to help people. When I was young, my father used to always say, take care of your own backyard, Andrea. Just take care of what's yours. Don't go out and, and get in everybody else's life and get in everybody else's business. Just take care of your own. And I used to look at him and I'd go, I don't understand, Dad. I mean, you're the one that takes care of the backyard, first of all. And I, I mean, I'd rather clean my friend's bedroom than clean my own bedroom. I don't know about you, but I mean, going into other people's stuff is far more interesting than going into my own stuff. So, 
I was constantly always out on the streets. If I saw a sign up that said dog lost, I was driving around looking for the dog. You're thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could find that dog and bring it home to that lady? And she'd be so happy and she'd say, you made my whole life so much better. And I'd be like, you know, keep the, keep the 20 bucks, you know, that you were going to give me for finding the dog. And I used to do this all the time. I would be over at my friend's house. My friends would be unloading their you know, groceries or something. And I'd say, can I help? And I'd be helping them with things. And my poor father would be at home going, where is she? Why isn't she cleaning her own room? Why isn't she doing her own things for us? And I realized that's who I am as a person. I'm a, I'm a person that is a, a, a child of the world. And I, I love to be entrenched in everything that's going on around me. Well, being a curator isn't it hasn't been just enough for me. Like, I mean, you'd think it fills up my whole life, but my heart is, I, see, I think sometimes it's so big. And maybe I have a, a crazy addictive personality or something, but I have to always have more of everything. It's like, I used to tell people, more is more, and I want it. I want, you know, I have one dog, and then I see another one for adoption, and I got another dog, and I saw another one for adoption, and I got another dog, and then the city of Santa Ana says, you can only have three dogs. I'm like, okay, well, I'm done with that one. So what do I do next? So I go to one artist and I go to the next artist and all of a sudden you start to see this years grow. I've been able to accomplish in a very short amount of time over 300 art exhibitions with artists from around the world. And I've been able to publish over 35 books that represent their life's works. And to me, this is something that has given me great, great uh, joy in my life. And it's given me great hope that the other people that are out in the world can somehow glean something from that, can grow and learn from that. And that makes me having that little, what they call the, the education seed that's kind of growing within you, where you want to reach out and help other people. So a thing I started to do when I was very, I guess it was my early part of my career, because it was so stressful working in the arts and all the pressure of fundraising and working with temperamental artists, sometimes not so temperamental. I've been fortunate enough to have great people. But I started doing this thing every week where I started saying, what about my personal box, living outside of my comfort zone and expanding what I want to think of? I mean, I work with artists who inspire me all the time, but what about me? What can I do personally other than just do these things for my, my business? So a thing I started doing uh, a while ago was I started to donate my time to people. Um, and so for, it started to be a half hour a week where I would say, okay, if anybody needs anything, resourcing, you need to find an apartment, you want to find a good used car, you want to sell something at a, you know, just give me a call, I'll help you do it. And so slowly but surely I started having people call me and I would have a friend call me from overseas and they'd say, I'm coming to California and I need an apartment for a week, can you help me find one? And I would get on the internet and I would call on the phone and I would look up ads and I would help them find the apartment and boom, they were here. And then I would have a friend of mine call me and says, you know, I've lost my job, she said, I, I have this Rolex you know, wristwatch that I need to sell and I need that money to pay my rent next month and can you help me sell the Rolex, Andrea? And I said, sure. I called a bunch of antique dealers. Hey, do you sell Rolexes? Find a place. Boom, next day she sells the watch, has rent money, goes and pays the rent. So I'm seeing all these things happening and I'm thinking to myself, this is magic. This is like, it's like a little adrenaline rush every time something good happens. But also there's this risk, of course, if you let people down, you know, I could, I could say, oh, I can help you, and then all of a sudden I can't find the apartment, or I can't sell the Rolex, or I can't, you know, find the lost dog. And, and that has, you know, that has a, another effect on, on a person. So what I started doing was I started saying, okay, Andrea, you can win, 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 but there's going to be some losses. Then be honest about it, you know, in your own personal life. You're going to go out and you're going to knock the ball out of the park, and then there's other times when you're not. And instead of just saying, oh, 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 that was nothing, say, hey, I'm human. Sometimes I can pull it off and sometimes I can't, just like an artist. Sometimes the work is over the top and it raises your heart and, you're, and, and, you, and you can't go without thinking about it. And other times you're walking through looking at things going, uh-huh, 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 very nice. That's your life's work? Well, I'll talk to you later. And that's the way it is with life. So one day, this is a story, I'm going to tell you just like two quick stories. Um, I decided I want to get involved with the students and teaching. So I opened up an after-school outreach program through the Grand Central Arts Center. And I'm working with students that are from the Santa Ana High School. We decide to raise money for materials and snacks and have art classes. And we hire different graduate students to teach. And um, one day, I'm sitting there in the classroom. And this uh, young girl who's in the class brings in her younger sister. And her sister's sitting there. And she's kind of hunched over. And she looks a little sad. And I said to the student, I said, you know, what's wrong with your sister? And she said, She's really doing poorly in school and uh, she's feeling really ill. She has this bump on the back of her head right here, Andrea, and we don't know what it is. And we don't have health insurance and there's nothing that we've been able to figure out. And I said, well, 
let me look. So I parted her dark, thick black hair, and I look in, and there's this huge knot on the back of her head right here, red and swollen. And I'm thinking to myself, what the heck? You know, this is a young girl. She needs some medical care. So I go upstairs. I grab one of my staff. I said, I'm leaving. I'm taking these two girls to the clinic down the way. We're going to go have this doctor look at this knot on the back of her head. My staff person says to me, Andrea, are you crazy? You legally, I mean, taking the kids from the school, from the building, putting them in your car, driving, you're going to get in trouble. You can't risk yourself for other people. You, you, you just send her home and let her deal with it. I said, this has been going on for a long time. So I decide, I'm taking this on. I go, I take them to the hospital over the clinic, and we walk in, no health insurance. I said, I need to speak to a physician about this young girl. She has a pain in her head. The doctor comes out. He looks at me. I said, we don't have any insurance, but I just need you to tell me if there's something you can do to help this girl. And he looks at me, and he smiles. He says, well, where are you coming from? I said, well, I'm working with the Grand Central Arts Center in Santa Ana. We have an art program, after school program. This girl came to class, and she's not feeling well. He looks at the nod on her head. He said, she needs surgery. He says, she has an abscess in the back of her head, and she needs to have surgery right away. And he says, but you can't be here without a parent. You need to go and get her parent, and you need to bring them back. So I tell the girls, OK, I'm taking you to your apartment. I drive them home. And their mother is very, very ill. She's living in an apartment there, father also very ill. And I said, one of the parents has to come tomorrow. We're going to the clinic, and we're going to have outpatient surgery. And the one girl who's sick, she just puts her head down, and she says, OK. I said, I'll pick you up in the morning, OK, and then we'll go. So the next day, I show up, and the three ladies are on the curb, the young girl who's hurting, the sister, and the mother. And I put them in my car, and we go to the clinic. Within two hours, we have outpatient surgery. Now, the clincher to all this is that I didn't have the money to pay for this. I was like, I'm, I'm an artist, too. I'm, I'm just making ends meet. And what I did that night before I went and got the girls was I called a couple artists that I know. And I said, hey, something's happened. There's a young girl who needs help. I need some money. Can you help me? They didn't even, they didn't even not even for a moment, hesitate. I said, Andrew, what do you want? Come over to the house and get the money. You just come get it. I drove over. I got the money. Went there, paid the doctor. It was like $250 cash. Boom. He takes her in there, injects her, gives her the surgery, relieves the pain, gives her medication, sends us on our way. We're driving home, and I'm thinking to myself, how lucky am I to be able to have these students that I know. They're so f amazing people. And a brave girl like this to go through this, and these artists who stood up and said, we're going to do this. We don't know, Andrew, what you're talking about, really, but we believe in you. Let's do it. Let's help somebody. And they did it. On the way home, the sister says to me, thank you. I said, you're welcome. And she says, you know, it's my sister's birthday today. I said, what? I said, we want outpatient surgery on her birthday? Are you kidding me? She goes, no. So I, I pull over into the grocery store, and I get out of the car, and I leave the air conditioner running, and I run inside, and I grab the biggest, coolest looking cake I can find, and a bouquet of flowers. And I turn around, and I come to the car, and she's still hunched over because of the pain in her head, and I hand the cake to her mother, and I hand the flowers to her, and I said, happy birthday. And she's looked at me, and she said, you're crazy. <laughs> and I said, I know. And I said, sometimes in life, you've got to be crazy and just do what you need to do. And as we're driving home, they're saying, but we can't eat all this cake. You should have half of it. I mean, you bought the cake, and you should take it home. And I said, this is your party. This is your celebration. This is your time to eat cake. I said, believe me, just having this experience with you, just being able to help you, has given me so much of my life you don't even want to know. And it'll save me the calories, because I don't need them. <laughs> so enjoy the cake. They got out of the car, and they left. And I never saw them again. I called and checked one time on them, but I knew that from that day forward, those girls were different. And the next time someone needed help, and the next time they needed help, they knew that they could go to someone, especially some crazy artists. The next thing I want to tell you about is a very particular thing. I, I drive around picking up artworks all the time. I'm really um, notorious for having a strong back. And I lift, and I move. And I was moving one day a lot of different things uh, to my house. And I had rented this huge 16-foot truck. And uh, I was driving down the street, going to my house. I dropped off all this furniture, and I was heading back. And I looked on the side of the road, and there was these three young guys standing on the road in this huge entertainment unit. I mean, the thing must have been from here to here with the glass cabinets in it. It was all fully built on the curb. And next to that is a little, little minivan. 
and they're standing there and they're talking back and forth and they're looking at the minivan and they're going, it's not going to fit. And they're looking at the minivan and I'm driving along. And I'm going, here we go, Andrea, another insurance deal. You've got a truck that you've rented. Now you're going to go and you're going to try and help somebody and you're going to have a liability and you're going to lift this unit and you're going to break your back and you got all these problems. And then I thought, Andrea, you know what? Pull the truck around. Those guys are never going to get that thing in that van. And if the sun goes down any quicker, they're going to be stuck out there standing next to that thing. So I whip the truck around, I pulled up next to them, and I get out, and I said, so what are you guys up to? And immediately, they all get defensive. Oh, well, we're just uh, standing here trying to get this unit in the, in the, in the, you know, the van. I go, that's not going to fit. The guy goes, I know it's not going to fit. And then the two older guys back off from me because they're like, whoa, we're in trouble. Something's wrong. And the youngest kid comes up. He goes, yeah, he goes, this is not good because it's for our mother. We, we can't get this thing home. And I said, well, you see that over there? That's my truck. I rented it today. I said, if you'd like, I could help you move it. I go, where do you live? About three miles from here. So I said, okay. He goes, well, how much money do you want? I said, I don't want any money. I just want to help you. So the guy has come over to me, and I, and I go up, and I start to go to take the lift gate down. You know how those big trucks have those lift gates? And I'm used to it. I, I leverage the lever. I grab the thing. I wham. I lay it down. But the guy goes, no, 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 no. I'll do it, right? So he goes and grabs the lever, and he's pulling the thing. He's like, huh, huh, huh. It won't lower. And I look at him, I go, you're not going to get that thing down. And immediately, the other two guys start laughing. Oh, this girl shows you up. Oh, she's so, is she showing you up, boy? I was like, come on, you guys. Let's just get this thing done. We pull the thing down. We get the thing loaded. It's heavier than heavy. I follow them along. We get to their house. The minute we get there, the mother is out in the driveway. The father's out in the driveway. Everybody's out there like it's a big party. And we're opening the truck, and we're bringing the thing in. And the youngest guy walks up to me and says, thanks for doing that. I really appreciate it. Are you sure you don't want any money? I said, no, I don't want any money. I said, but I do want something. And he said, whatever. He goes, what is it? And he kind of looked curious at me. I just said, next time you're driving down the street in a large moving truck, and you see somebody on the side of the road trying to fit an entertainment unit into a very small van, <laughs> you have to promise me that you will pull over and help them. And he smiled at me. He said, I promise. And I said, have a good day. And I got in the truck, and I drove away. And I thought about all the things I'd missed doing, from getting dinner prepared and you know, getting all the things unpacked that I was dealing with. And I thought to myself, you know what, Andrea? This is what, this is what artists do. This is what we're about. We live outside the box because that's where we're the most comfortable. And you know what? If we weren't out there doing these things and making a difference, then the next generation and the next generation after that, they wouldn't be able to be mentored by such greatness. Today, we are surrounded by so many great people. And when you, when you think about how many people you've touched and how that goes to the next generation and the next generation, it gives you so much hope. I can't even read the front page of the newspaper without getting teary-eyed. I'm that sensitive. Today has really touched my heart. I'm going to continue to go out and do crazy, crazy artist things, crazy creative outside of the box things. It's guaranteed. That's who I am. I, I just think that every day it's a gift. As long as I keep my strong back and I keep my, my, my energy high and I keep my focus goals and I keep going forward, I'm going to be OK. I just want you to all know that if you ever need to sell a Rolex, if you ever need an apartment, <laughs> If you ever know a great artist who really, really needs a strong person, get in touch. Because you know what? The door's wide open. And I'm right here. And I know you're there for me, too. And I thank you so much.